introduction. Thanks so much to the organizers for the invitation. So, uh, what I'm talking about today is about gastric carcinogenesis. And uh, can I have uh, the, the slides displayed only there? Okay, so I'm coming from Portugal and uh, I'm working in Porto, which is in the northern part of Portugal. And uh, actually, what we have in gastric cancer, what I'm going to address today is something like, how oh, does this move on? First thing is to put things moving. Does it move? Yes. So the first thing is that what I'm going to do today with you is to go briefly, we don't have much time, through the major settings of gastric cancer, which is gastric cancer developing in the sporadic setting, and uh, shortly about hereditary gastric cancer. Behind these two types of gastric cancer, we have the precursor lesions, and actually, if we want to interfere with the burden of gastric cancer all over the world, we have to insist and to develop better means for early diagnosis, which is something that will be out of the scope of this presentation. What I'm going to address is gastric carcinogenesis very briefly, sporadic gastric carcinoma and the precursor lesions, and the hereditary gastric carcinoma. And if we are talking about gastric carcinogenesis, we have to come back always to what is called the Correa model of gastric carcinogenesis. By the way, you may know that Playa Correa is retiring later this year in June, so it is also an, an opportunity to, 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 to mention the marvelous, the superb work that he has developed. So Patrick Tan has already shown this same model using histological pictures, and what we have here is a cascade of events from normal gastric mucosa until gastric carcinoma. And this describes quite well what happens in the so-called intestinal type of gastric cancer, but not all types of gastric cancer. Here I want to highlight the role of H. pylori that we will not discuss in detail. And I want also to highlight something that usually we do not discuss which is the role of uh, bone marrow-derived stem cells that can come to the stomach and differentiate in epithelial cells and become the source of gastric cancer. And this is something that usually we do not think of. And I want to highlight also something that is written here, is that when you think about gastric cancer and the precursor lesions, you have chronic astritis, you have chronic atrophic astritis, and you think about intestinal metaplasia. But you should think also about what is designated by SPAM, which is a special type of metaplasia in the stomach that you can see here, and it stands for spasmolytic polypeptide expressing metaplasia. I will come later to this issue. And so we have to consider all these steps for a better understanding. But when you think about the major etiological role of gastric cancer, which is, for the moment, still H. pylori besides diet, you have to think also that there is much more in the stomach than H. pylori. And the trend today is to consider the role of the microbiome that can encompass H. pylori, but can also be devoid of H. pylori. This is becoming so important that actually, if you think about the stomach, if you have H. pylori there, this becomes the most prevalent microorganism. But if H. pylori is not there, you have a variety of microorganisms in the stomach. And the consequences of this colonization can be quite different in one or the other setting. And this is something that was acknowledged recently. And some of you may be aware that, for instance, the so-called European Helicobacter Study Group has been changed the name to European Helicobacter and Microbiota Study Group in 2015. And there are already some papers addressing this issue about the role of microbiome and the development of different precursor lesions and also gastric cancer. So maybe in the future we have to learn a lot from this information. If you come to sporadic gastric cancer, what we know about this is that the precursor lesions are those I've already mentioned. We do not have the time to go through, but I want to emphasize mainly the so-called dysplastic lesions that in some parts of the world are designated as intraepithelial neoplasia. 
and in the stomach we should be prepared to identify, and that is in our hands pathologists, to identify two major types of gastric dysplasia. One of these types shows the features of dysplasia in the colon and rectum, and we call this intestinal type dysplasia. And you can see, if I would show any of you this picture, you would say this is dysplasia, maybe in the polyp in the colon, which is not the case, this was in the stomach. And we call this the intestinal type, and the cells are columnar, and the nuclei are pensinolinated and are hyperchromatic and localized at the basal part of the cells. And you have another type of gastric dysplasia that we pathologists, for the moment, are still not making a huge effort to characterize, but we should in the future. Because, for instance, in our hands, this type of gastric dysplasia is the one that is more frequently uh, displaying also features of high-grade dysplasia, and frequently there are concomitant lesions of this plastic type or even invasive apnocarcinoma. So we should be aware of this also. If we move to the tumors themselves, the advanced tumors, these are very heterogeneous. They are heterogeneous at the gross uh, presentation because they can change from polypoid until widely invasive and this is the classification of Borgman. You are aware of it for sure. And they are also very heterogeneous at the microscopic level. And if, here you have the major types, tubular, papillary, the so-called poorly cohesive in this circumstance constituted by signet ring cells. And if there is uh, accumulation of mucus extracellular, this is the mucinous type. You are most probably aware of the last classification of this logical pattern of gastric carcinoma. This was published in the last issue of WHO book, the fourth edition in 2010. And here what is different from what was described in the past is there you should designate it what in Lorin's classification we call as diffuse carcinoma. According to WHO classification, these tumors should be designated as poorly cohesive carcinoma. And if they are mainly constituted by signet ring cells, then you can say it's a signet ring cell carcinoma. Why has this change been done? Because we have many tumors in the stomach that are poorly cohesive and do not show the features of signet ring cells. And we have also acknowledged the presence of mixed carcinomas, and these are those in which you have in the same tumor a mixture, a component of glandular structure with poor liquisive component. And this is important because there is an impact of these tumors in the prognosis of the patients, and the survival of the patients harboring this type of tumors is much worse than those having pure carcinomas. If you concentrate in the pure types of gastric cancer, and this would be a tubular papillary according to WHO, that according to Lorenz corresponds to intestinal carcinoma, and this would be a poorly cohesive in this circumstance, a signet ring cell type corresponding to diffuse carcinoma in Lorenz classification. And here I want to highlight that WHO classification that I'm showing you again is not substantially different from the Japanese classification of gastric cancer. What is substantially different is from Nakamura classification. So if you use Japanese classification of gastric cancer, that is not substantially different from WHO. And I want to highlight this because this has an impact in the interpretation of the studies we perform, namely at the molecular level. And what do we know uh, uh, regarding the molecular features of the different types of gastric cancer? After having listened to the talk of Patrick Tan, this, is, this becomes a bit difficult, but even so, Patrick, you will excuse me, but I have to address this very briefly. What do we pathologists do in our routine? Mainly, when the oncologist requests, we search for the expression of ER2 that when amplified and demonstrated by fish analysis has an impact in the prognosis and also in the therapy because this is a targetable uh, molecular alteration. We search also for microsatellite instability in specific settings and not so frequent for epidermal growth factor receptor. What is the major event in the poorly cohesive carcinomas? The major event concerns CDH1 gene 
and coding for ecadrine. Briefly, what happens with ecadrine gene in gastric cancer of sporadic type is that there are mutations concentrating in an odd spot which encompass exons 8 and 9, and there is poor or loss of expression or decreased ex expression of the protein in the neoplastic cells. And this is due, as I said, as the first somatic mutation followed as the second mechanism of inactivation of the protein that is due to promote the methylation of the gene. Regarding ER2 expression, this has been addressed this morning several times. We pathologists, we search for the immune expression of the protein, and when it is expressed at the cell membrane, and uh, it encompasses the whole surface of the cell membrane, this is score as 3 plus. The problem is when we score as 2 plus, that should be confirmed by additional studies to demonstrate the amplification of the gene. This is relevant because of the impact in the prognosis, though not not all studies have demonstrated there is an impact in prognosis. In our hands, ER2 amplification has really an impact in prognosis and the relationship with blood-borne metastasis. I will not address the application of this knowledge to therapy that stems from Toga's study and the use of transduzumab that you know much better than me. What about microsatellite instability? I'm sure that you oncologists in this room are more used to ask for microsatellite instability in the setting of colorectal cancer, but that occurs in gastric cancer in about 15 to 20 percent of the cases, and is considered as a molecular marker of good prognosis in gastric cancer. It's similar to what happens in the colon, and what we know also is that in gastric cancer, this microsatellite instability is due to the promoter hypermethylation of the gene HMLH1. And what are we doing now with this knowledge? What we are doing now with this knowledge is that we participate in a consortium and can passing our research institute, Ipatimup in Port, together with another center in Quimber and BGI, which is settled, as you know, in Beijing in China. And what we are doing is that we have characterized our samples, our series of gastric cancer, according to these molecular features, ER2 amplification, CDH1 loss and microsatellite instability, and the question we are asking with this NGS approach is to figure out which are the molecular features within each of these groups that could help us to understand the predictive value of the therapy in gastric cancer where to amplification that would help us to understand the reasons why the patients are bringing tumors with loss of expression of ecadrine have a poor prognosis and also regarding the better explanation of microsatellite instability. This NGS study is underway and we hope to get some results that may may be relevant for the better understanding of gastric cancer. So, but if you move from here, and we have now, this is difficult to move this thing. Now it's stopped. Can I have the next slide? Okay, thank you. But as we have heard already from the paper of the discussion, uh, the, can I move? This is not working smoothly now. Okay, thank you. And Patrick Tan has already said that in the stomach, besides ER2 amplification, that all of us and we pathologists know very well, there is also amplification of other genes and encoding for receptor tyrosine kinases. And these are the genes are fibroblastic growth factor receptor. KRAS, epidermal growth factor, and MET. The problem of MET is an important, important for, problem for you oncologists because you know the results of the clinical trials targeting MET, and this is an issue. What is relevant in gastric cancer is that when you have the amplification of one of these genes, this is mutually exclusive, which is a, a very peculiar feature of gastric cancer that we learned today that happens also with other genes, such as GATA4 and 6, as Patrick Tan has explained. Even more interesting to, for, than this aspect for me is what comes out from the study of Singapore group regarding expressing profile. And here what they have demonstrated is that we can identify three major types of gastric cancer, the mesenchymal type, the proliferative type, and the so-called metabolic. Mesenchymal would correspond to diffuse tumors, proliferative would correspond to intestinal type tumors, and the metabolic type could be 
intestinal diffuse. What is interesting, interesting in, our, in our mind is that the metabolic is due to the expression of genes normally expressed in gastric mucosa, and the relevancy of this is that apparently there is an impact of this profile in the response of the tumors of drugs usually used, such as 5-FU, and what really is exciting for me, for us as pathologists, is that in these genes there is overexpression of the proteins related to that metaplastic change I am talking from the beginning, which is spasmolytic expression metaplasia, which means gastric differentiation. Why is this relevant for us? This is relevant because we have demonstrated in gastric cancer that even tumors with tubular and papular structure, they can have gastric differentiation, and we can have other tumors with intestinal differentiation, and we have studied this in depth, and we have demonstrated that this different differentiation occurs also in these plastic lesions in which you have can have gastric type, you have intestinal type. So in our minds, if you come back to the model proposed by Playa Correa, the way we read it today is that the gastric path the carcinogenic pathway is not just one way, but is split in two different uh, pathways, one following the gastric differentiation pattern that we believe may be related to the metabolic genotype. Patrick Tan is well aware of this and even provided us the histological pictures of the tumors having this profile. That is something that we are studying at the moment. But you have heard already about this summary study about the different types of gastric cancer as it comes from the Cancer Genome Atlas study. And what for us pathology is very interesting is that what this extensive study showed is that there are these four major types of gastric cancer that correspond actually to something we knew already, which there are tumors intestinal type with chromosomal instability, that there are tumors microsatellite instability, which correspond to tumors with hypermethylation, most also with intestinal type, phenotype, and you have the gastric stable tumors that correspond to diffuse type gastric cancers relate to CDH1 alterations and similar alterations such as raw eye. And you have the Epstein bar virus related related gastric cancer, which is at the moment one of the most appealing types of gastric cancer. And the reason of this is that we pathologists can recognize this pattern. And for you oncologists, there is this overexpression of this ligon, which is PDL1 and PDL2, which is targetable. And this is important. The relevance of targeting this ligand, which is PDL1, has been demonstrated in tumors in different organs and also in the stomach, has been clearly demonstrated. And the issue is that the tumor cells, they have a, a ligand, which is PDL1, that is a ligand for PD1. And when this linkage is operating, this has an inhibitory effect in the immune response of the tumor and the tumors become more aggressive and the patients have a poor survival. So the targetable, the targetable molecules here are PDL1 and PD1, and this is something that you oncologists, I think you are using already in different models such as melanoma and other tumor types. In gastric cancer, what we think it is necessary to do is to identify the best antibody to demonstrate the overexpression, for instance, of PDL1, and also to settle uh, the, <clears throat> the patterns of expression that the clinicians can use to evaluate the results of this immunotherapy. If we move now briefly to hereditary gastric cancer, you are aware of the existence of this syndrome, hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, acknowledged recently, published in the last issue of WHO, for which we have now plenty of information which is well characterized, that if you are really interested, you can review in this, public, in this paper recently published in Lancet Oncology. And the, the features of the disease is that we, the patients are carriers of germline mutations of CDH1 gene. In the stomach, you have numerous foci of invasive cancer and also the precursor lesions, and you have two major types, the parasitoid spread of signet ring cells and in situ carcinoma. And it is well known now the guidelines for dealing with the carriers of the patients with these mutations, which have been published 
already three times. The last issue of the guidelines were recent published in the Journal of Medical Genetics in 2015, and I strongly recommend you oncologists to read this paper because there is a lot of clinical uh, information and recommendations in this paper with an impact in your everyday life. If we come to my side of pathology, what we know now is that those tiny foci can remain in the stomach indolent for long, for years, and we do not know what the reasons are for these foci becoming aggressive, and we are performing several studies. We know now that a different reason is present in the expression of proliferative markers that are present in the cases when they become aggressive and widely invasive and also P53, something that was really astonishing because we were not aware of the disturbance of P53 in signet ring cell carcinoma and it appears to be the molecular marker of aggressiveness that will conduct the, the situation from an indolent situation to an aggressive type of gas cancer and you will see this soon published. If you come to the mutation types, you, can, you know that in hereditary gastric cancer, the mutations are germline. They are different from the somatic because they span the whole extension of the gene, which is localized in chromosome 16. There are different types of mutations, and 20% are missense mutations. So it means when a patient is a carrier of a pathogenic mutation, it should be offered the possibility of prophylactic hysterectomy. If the patient is a carrier of missense mutation, this has to be better characterized to analyze if it is pathogenic or not, and only the carriers of pathogenic missense mutations should be offered prophylactic mucosectomy. This is very relevant, but this is an update. You should be aware that more than CDH mutation can be a cause of hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. There is this paper describing two families with mutations germline in the gene encoding for e catenin and if you go through the more recent literature, and this was published in JAMA, you will be aware of the existence of other genes in which germline mutations can cause syndromes that display the clinical features of hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. So if you have a family for which you have the clinical profile and you do not find mutation CDH1 gene, you should be aware there are other genes that can cause that disease and you should search for. And this is the last issue, and concerns another type of hereditary, diffuse gastric, uh, hereditary gastric cancer. This is the so-called GAP syndrome, and it stems for gastric adenocarcinoma and proximal polyposis of the stomach. Here is totally different. You don't have diffuse type gastric cancer. You have intestinal type gastric cancer developing in the setting of a proximal polyposis of the fundic uh, type. And the issue here is that I've written that the genetic defect is not identified yet. This is not true. It was identified. It was not published. So wait and see. Soon we will get the gene. So summarizing hereditary gastric cancer, we have two major types, hereditary diffuse and the GAP syndrome. And this is Portugal. This is Portugal. Thank you so much for your attention.